you know, with any luck, we get some good, we get some good weather today. I think we're going to I very exciting, so very exciting, you know, so we'll see. That was really nice. And I walked down to the store. Uh, yeah, I, I was, uh, I was more than happy to sit back and read while you're doing that. That was very exciting. It was nice. No, we are. Okay. Uh, okay. Anyway, morning, yeah, so. Caleb. Morning, Ben. Hey, what's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? Anyway, yeah. So it's good to feel the good weather. It's going to be very exciting today. Oh, I know. You know, I have to turn my volume down on this thing. No, it's going to be good. It's going to be a good, good, uh, good drinking weather, as as you would say, mm-hmm. as opposed to any day. It's good drinking weather, as you would say, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> anyway, that's good. So it'll be fun. It'll be fun to get out. This 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 week took forever, by the way. Oh, I know. This is, a, this is a long week. I don't know why it was a long week. This was. It Morning, just was, Jim. You know, but um, yeah. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll see how this goes. Ooh, I mean, I got my appropriate shirt for today with George Washington on it. Oh, that's right. And um, by the way, congratulations on your coronation, Mary. That's why well I'm done. wearing George Washington well today? Well done. Well done. You got you got yourself a new king, Charles in charge, Mary. The yep. L- Life. So that's pretty exciting for, for you, uh, you people who don't know how to throw tea off a boat, but that's okay. We'll hey, we anyway. tried. Actually, Anybody? no, we didn't. No, we did not try. And I mean, I know this is like a civil war live stream, but um, just real quick, I'm reading a book about the American Revolution, and I did not realize that um, Benjamin Franklin was um, he was the one kind of leading this charge to get Canada to be the 14th colony, and he was up there in like Montreal at one point trying to convince the Canadians, you know, and they were like having nothing to do with it. And I was really surprised, like, you know, I'd always wondered why didn't we get involved, you know, and kind of say F you like you guys did, but for some reason we didn't. I well, you know what, you know, you know what happened was because the British messed with Boston. That's yeah. what happened. Oh, I know. Nobody messes with Boston. Mary. Yeah. This book, deal. I can't remember the author's name, but it's really good. And that's kind of like, it's out of my comfort zone. My comfort zone is admittedly the civil war, but um, I am reading Confederates in the Attic, which is a very good book. Uh, that is a very so good book. Much better than Ty Sedgley's Robert E. Lee and Me. I don't feel like I'm being preached at. No, no, it's good. It's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you like that book, though. It's for, for being totally serious because that that book is interesting. If not only because it gave birth to the phrase "farb," but it tells it tells different stories. I used to live in Texas, uh, and one of the chapters takes place down there. You can, there's definitely a different attitude, and. Um, but it's good though because I, I we've we've said before we we were on where the hell were we, we were on um what podcast were we on last weekend? Uh, Tyler um, on Filter Historian. Yes, and we were talking about that a little bit. And um, admittedly, I, I'm gonna unabashedly say that I'm not a fan of Sedgley's book because I, I'm I not think in, it, I'm not anymore either. I I was um just real quick. Caleb was asking me what part of Canada I'm from, which is Ontario, and is there a decent sized French population? No, there's not, not in Ontario. We do have like French immersion schools though. So the kids learn all in French. And we also, we take French like all through from like kindergarten to grade 12. I don't speak a word of it though. I actually know grade 10 is when you can stop taking it. So I don't speak a word of it. Quebec is the uh, French speaking province. Uh, They are, I believe they're over 50% French speakers there. Um, No, uh, yeah, it makes, that makes sense. I mean, but um. Yeah, but I think real quick, I, I think I think person to sedually book is designed. It paints with a very very broad brush, it and I, I mean I and I read that book. And I, I mean I felt guilty for merely driving through Virginia, and I'm not yeah. even from there. I just think it's unfair. I, I think and, and it's and we've said this before online. It's given birth to a new aggressive Twitter. It has where where basically look. We we've said this before. I'll say it again. I'm unabashed. I'm, I'm a dark dark blue yep, support and all that but i mean sometimes you gotta you gotta be fair you, you just can't and and i i think the pro the problem with that book is it makes it look like every single every single person who ever fought in that war on the confederate side was a slave owning racist monster and and obviously they had it had a share on, on the politicians and stuff like that but i think as you read the soldier diaries like we do mm-hmm. specifically you know talking about john and charlie futch with with uh, pete last week yeah. you, you know you certainly learn um 
that most of these dudes were, were conscripted in a lot of them were, and they didn't, they didn't give a shit less about politics or slavery. No, they, they, and that's they, the thing. It, it's the politics. And I do agree with you about this, actually, but the first time I read it, I thought it was really good. I relate it to some of it, having been raised a little bit, you know, like my parents um, in Ontario, where they went to school, like they did learn a little bit about the civil war, but it was like, it was the lost cause narrative that was, was taught. So um there was a very, I was, you know, kind of that point of view, right? Um, now it wasn't oh. hardcore or whatever, but it was, you know, very, so I was reading it and relating to some of Sedgley's childhood and I felt guilty. And then I read it, and then I read it again. And I was like, whoa, something's wrong here with this painting with a broad brush, like saying that, you know, it turns into this very preachy thing where you can't like, I, the one thing I've noticed this dangerous trend on Twitter is that, you know, you'll be talking about Robert E. Lee, talking about his military stuff, or you're talking about John Brown Gordon from a military standpoint, and someone speak, will butt into the conversation and be like, well, you do know he was a slave owner. You do know, like he was, it's like, I'm not talking about that aspect of him. I don't like that aspect of him, but talk about it from a military standpoint, you know? No. And, and you know, and there was, there was a lot of that flashpoint last week with the memorial at the Arlington national cemetery that yep. they're taking out. And I, I will admit that I don't think that's appropriate place for that monument mm -hmm. because of where, of the whole history, but it turns into, again, the monument grabbers where every single monument, and, and, you know, the thing about it though, is, you know, I've turned, I've done, a, I've really changed on this I uh, admittedly. I, and, and so why, you know, a, year, a while ago, I, I was, you know, until I really understood the, the history of the Confederate monuments, those yeah. three specific time phrases, those phases. Yeah. And we got in some issue on social media. You did anyway. And of course I stumbled into it about how, you know, that monument led to taking every single one of them down and blah, blah, blah. And you well, can't put the them thing all was, it. like, and, I and, saw but, then, but then somebody, somebody disagree with them and we liked the tweet and then we got hit for liking. We got it. called like, out for liking the tweet. And it's like, it's like, Whoa. It's like friggin' A, man. Like, it's, so I saw some tweets that basically were talking about melting it down or throwing it in the Potomac was one of them. And I did my own tweet and I said, like, let's put it on display somewhere and tell the story and not get rid of it. And someone like chimed in was like going on first. It was the whole, like, I don't know what it was. It's like, you do know what that monument represented. And I'm like, I know full well what it represented. I'm saying to keep it to um, in a museum or wherever to tell the history of it and explain it um, so that we don't like, so that people understand, you know, what happened and the why behind it. Um, and then it turned into this, like, well, how are you going to preserve 1500 monuments and where are you going to get the money? And it's like, that's not what I'm talking about, but like, no. it's, you know, and it's, but I think a lot of this does go back to the Sedgley effect where, and that's what right. we phrased it as, where you can be like, as long as you're Northern, you can be a dick to people. And it's like, no, it's, 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 the, it's the, do it. he put a capital J on the just cause and he, he, oh, it, it, it turned into you know, it's funny how how, how it, the effect it really has. I mean, we were, I was, we were reading a, an article in the New York Times last week that our neighbor had given us about Robert E. Lee, and and, and it it talks about a lot of stuff. I'm like, wait, that's not even true. There was, you know, it, it, I've I've seen on lectures from people who should who should know better that A. P. Hill, after the war. Uh, yeah. committed war crimes. And I always thought that A.P. Hill was killed in April of 1865. That, but didn't he commit and, war crimes in Canada? Right, in, in Canada. So it's like, what the hell? And these are PhD level people. So there's, again, read, but then obviously you got to question what you read because it's open season on a lot of things. And if you're going to study the war, you're going to study the history, you got to study both sides. You have to. And, and that doesn't mean that it's the it's the, the good versus the evil empire, depending on which way you see it. Because we, we've seen it a long time on the other side. I've, I, I've told you before, you know, so I had to get separated in Gettysburg from some dude who was trying to tell me Lincoln was a tyrant. And okay, fine. That's what you think. I don't care. But, but again, now it's going the other way where not every one of these people, I mean, it, I think, you know, reading those, those private voices website and reading a lot of the letters we do, it opens your mind to a lot of different things. It doesn't mean yeah. you're going to sympathize with it, but yeah. you have to understand that if, if, if you're going to paint, if you're going to use a shotgun instead of a, a 
you know, instead of a scalpel to de- determine this stuff, then you're going to be guilty of everything you've accused everybody else of being guilty. Exactly. Of. And, exactly. and ever since that book came out, it's really gone off. It really has. Yeah. It's really given people this kind of, you know, this, and the other thing we were told the other day too, was we can't possibly understand the issues because we're not from the area. Well, I mean, I don't know what to tell you, but I've read a lot about the monument issues and I have my own opinions on it and stuff, but I mean, it, it just went down like a road where I'm like, where is this all coming from? And, you know, just some of the stuff I see the, and it's on, like, as you said, it's on both sides, but it has, it's becoming embarrassing, you know, to look at some of this stuff. Oh, I, I know. It, yeah. it, it, it's like, you like take David it for a grain of salt. David, David Maxwell's on here and he said that he, and I saw this, he, he did his hashtag neverhood and it got removed from a Facebook group and he got a warning and it's like, what, what the hell? Never. Well, you know what? He made a comment about the Bruins a second ago, so he probably deserved that. So, no, that was that was never. No, who was that? Was Denison bastard? Yeah. But uh, but no, but that but the, but that's um that's the truth though. And I mean, we weren't planning on talking about this today, but it, but it, it who the hell knows? But it just it just seems like um it seems that people could be better suited by just reading more and ranting less, right? And studying the history and being able to have I don't know, you know and being able to I mean. Every one of us on here has different opinions, um, you know, about stuff. And like Jim, Jim just said, I've never agreed with taking the monuments down. I've always been in favor of reinterpreting them. I completely agree. Like that's, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to change See, the thing about it. It though, doesn't either... take it. The thing is, it doesn't take it away. It like, you know, you made a really good point on Twitter. Like it, this does not take away racism. It does not take away white, white supremacy by getting rid of them. You have to tell the story so that we understand what happened because and i can tell you right now if some of these civil war generals could come back and see some of the shit like chamberlain would probably be pretty pissed off he'd be like what the hell guys like this is not you know, what speak, we thought speak, speaking of chamberlain you see that book they found in his attic yeah that's pretty so, cool so they they found a, a book of, of when he was in his childhood on, on uh, his house in 80 chamberlain over there in brewer in the attic which had a bunch of notes in it uh, it's like a school book. And again, between that and the Robert Gould Shaw sword that was found around here, just once I'd like to find something cool like that. Wouldn't that be neat? That would be, that would you be know? really cool. Uh, AQ said, Darren, great bumper sticker, read more rant less. Exactly. Ali K likes your mug. Um, oh yeah. Well, Hey, weeks is British. Sorry. You got, you got to represent. Yeah. And Caleb said too, the Jim Crow monuments should be explained with additional de- details. Like we were in Richmond and that was where it really hit me. Um, seeing those empty pedestals and stuff. Yeah, that that was that was a, a that was it's a weird. moment for me because you know what though it, you know I, I I you know I guess that the more you study this stuff and, and the thing about it though is we're we're freaks of nature as are the people on this live who study this stuff all the time. Most people don't. Most people don't know the difference between Robert E. Lee and Sarah Lee. I realize that. Okay. And so there's that natural knee jerk, this guy, good, this guy, bad, this guy, yep. racist, this guy here, the whole deal. Right. And, and, and Sedgley's books t- does not help. It certainly doesn't. Bone yep. Kemper's book does not help. Um, you know, Gordon's memoirs certainly don't help on the yep. other side. Jubal early doesn't help in any way, shape or form. Admittedly, he does. Did but, he but really the, during the war though? Oh yeah. He's a guy like, I like Jubal. Lee's bad old man. I, I like, sure. but you know what the thing, the thing about it though, is that, you know, people want to study this stuff and, and seeing the empty pedestals and the grass over on Monument Ave in Richmond was, 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 was tough. It was because, and I was somebody who, yeah, they probably shouldn't have that there. This one shouldn't be there, but then you see that and you go, you know something, people are going to regret this someday. I don't, I don't agree with a lot of it. Uh, the ones that were put up during the Jim Crow era, the ones that are designed specifically for white supremacy, and that those those do exist. Yeah. But some some benign statue in downtown Winchester, of soldiers. I mean, th- those ones they tell the story. Now that it's not history, they're monuments. I realize yeah. that. That's like it's a monument is not a replacement for history. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, at the same time, you have to look at like it's like it's like I've said this before. There is no word in the English language by itself is bad yeah. there really isn't no. it's the motivation of the jerk who says it that makes mm-hmm. it bad right the same thing goes for the monuments if you have anything it's the interpretation of why why it was there yeah that, that's Some, what we need is the the that interpretation of why so that people can learn from it why were these put up you know why are they still up um you know like for instance like 
I never want them to touch the clay. I especially don't want them to touch the Claiborne statue in Ringgold Gap because that was not put up for bad reasons. It's no, so it's, well interpreted and it's it's a monument to him and he's standing there waiting for Joseph Hooker to come up. But it, but, it, but it tells us, it, they all tell the story uh, and, you know, it's, it, it'll take legitimately an act of Congress that takes statues down on battlefields. That, that'll never happen. No, that won't happen. Um, Although it almost actually it almost did in the forties that, that, yeah. that we're gonna have, they were gonna have to take some of them down to for for uh, metal for for weapons yeah. they, they, they they that was on that was on the list yeah. but uh, but certainly uh, but certainly it's it's it makes you study more it, it, you know it makes you look at it and, and so you can see it and for, so you can understand why things happen and why it's important not to repeat history and things like that yeah. but again that's that's just that rant but I think but I think it is important to have an open mind with this stuff yeah. to sit there and read stuff. You can you can look at anyone in the union, anyone in the south, and you can look at their details, and they've got good and they've got bad and they've got ugly. But yeah. you can't be closed minded to, to sit there and say Lee bad, Grant good, or you know Sherman bad, you know Gordon good. You, you just and, and, you can't. You have to talk about it. And, you know the one thing that I see, and this is where I really am starting to get ticked, like I ticked off about, is the fact that you know the the North is painted with this like brush of good, like everybody's fighting you know you know if you went and asked john reynolds are you fighting to free the slaves he would before he obviously say asked him this before he dies on july the first he would have said no reynolds was not an abolitionist and that's the side that doesn't get talked about a lot um oh, you, not- you know what they're doing they're using 21st century values on 19th century life and that, that and you can't do that i mean that that's ridiculous i mean you, you can't sit there and sit there and, i mean i, I understand Frederick Douglass probably today would be considered a hardcore racist mm-hmm. by today's standard. The slide, the scale is slid. And, and it's obviously we talked about, you know, the guy with the hat there and, you know, Lincoln, yep. the guy from Springfield, he, yep. he was, he was, he was no picnic when it came to that, but that's the whole point of it. I think people will be surprised to find out that Robert Gould Shaw was not an abolitionist. It was no. quite the opposite. His parents were, um, mm. but that's, that's the whole point of it. So I think like anything else, you have to, because because it, there comes a point now too. Is where do you stop? Yeah. Right? How, where do you draw the line? Washington owned slaves. You're going to take all his statues down. Lake, Lincoln's fa- yeah. Lincoln's family did exactly. Like there there, is, a, there is a connection. Grant's Grant married into like a slave a slave owning family. You know, um, it's like you know, and you you have to study these guys like from a military standpoint too. I mean. I enjoy studying John Brown Gordon. Do I like John Brown Gordon as a person? Not really. He was pretty shady and uh, racist and all that. But, you know, and MJ brings up another point. It's like the other thing. They oh, hey, MJ. Let's see. talk here. about, you know, they don't bring up the fact that Sherman was probably as big of a racist as some of the ones in that's fighting on the South. Like, yeah, and that, that, that that's talk you, you, that. you talk you talk about their own personal theories and that's a that's just just i guess the bottom line is don't paint with a broad brush and don't assume yeah. everyone is this and everyone is that yeah. and, and i think um and i think and this is fueled by the latest rant on twitter that you p- pushed me into by the way you know I didn't uh, and of, mean course, to, of course i've got to go ahead and support canada you know but but that's the that's the problem with this stuff is um is is you have to you have to be able to separate and, that, and that's the thing, too. I just don't know how you could possibly get a full understanding of the American Civil War by only studying one, one you side. Can't. You can't. And the thing is, is I think that, you know, and we've talked about this with MJ before, and you and I have talked about it quite a bit. Um, are you cold? I'm a little cold, yeah. Uh, good morning. I don't Frank. know why. Maybe uh, it's because my, my cold black heart dying uh, inside of me. Uh, we've talked about how, you know, people sometimes are afraid to study it happens on both sides because you might find you have something in common with them but i think too the other thing that happens is and this is my crazy theory you know is that sometimes it goes back to the fact that some of these guys in the south were just fighting for their home you know of course i've you know the, the, the and that's something the, that we all relate to we all the, the, the reality is the, the reality is most of the foot soldiers were I mean, when you, when you when you look at how many of these guys were conscripted, the fact that you could that there was no mail, it was so hard to get mail delivered in the South because most of the postmasters got conscripted. Yeah, there was no one to deliver the mail. I mean, and so little things like that. It, um, I, I think people need to realize it's it's a, it's a different era. It's a different mm-hmm. planet. We we are lucky that we will never understand the shit that they, that these people went through on so many levels of just the absolute misery and just, just the whole thing. 
in, in you know, try and exonify or try and exemplify or try and vilify um, by using today's standards isn't fair. It's just no. not. It's and just it's not. also not, it's also not history. It's not history to be like to stand there and judge from a 21st, you know, morals, whatever. We all know slavery was terrible, but to say that they like, like just, but we also know there was terrible people in the North too. And I mean, that's the thing is they're all human. They're not like, they're not, I don't know, somehow better, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it, it's, but it like what I see being done, like on Twitter is, is not history. It's becoming almost like no it's 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 sophomore where you get somebody who maybe seen episodes one seven and eight of the ken burns theory suddenly thinks that they're you know they're experts of the civil institute and they they push their values because they'll find whatever political spin they want to put on it they'll find those values and they'll use it to justify whatever the hell they want to whoever they want to shit on and that that, and that that's not unusual with civil war but it certainly is but um but i hope you know hope these, these things these things will go We'll go back and forth. And this and the monument issue has been going on since the 1890s. It is not a yeah. new issue. It's social media drives it. But ever since that first monument went up, um, the Confederate monument anyway, it, it started. I, if you yeah. if you if you really look at the just speaking of Gettysburg, if you look at the history of all those monuments, Virginia and then North Carolina, yeah. but then the the um, the Duluth monuments, the Mississippi, Louisiana. The history that goes into those about how how much they were fought, uh, and then what's interesting too is you can read some of the monuments yeah. and you can tell, like for example, uh, the Texas Monument was put in 1963, 100 anniversary. Yeah. That was right in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, right. And so if you in that that back if you read it and put it into that context, you, you get an idea of how the modern politics spills into the history and that's what's neat the monuments are cool because you can read them and it's a snapshot of the history but also a snapshot of when they were put up that's why it's important to distinguish the years of when they were put up yeah uh but but again this will go around and around and around it's never going to change i don't know i don't agree i don't agree with a lot of stuff i agree with some of it i don't agree with a lot of it yeah but uh but at the end of the day it's just something to talk about so who knows yeah well, right? it's, it's just it's like i don't know just the way the narrative has changed is I read a really good article that our friend uh, John Gentilly sent to us the other day, and it was about um, just the historical narratives and stuff. And there was a really um, good quote in there. um, And it basically was like, and I'm paraphrasing, it said, we are starting to replace one set of lies and myths with another. Yeah. And that's that's the truth. When I read that, I'm like, holy shit, that, that is what, that's kind of what's happening because like, I mean, I'm sorry. I like studying John Brown Gordon. I don't like who he was, but I also like studying Patrick Claiborne. I love studying Oliver Otis Howard. Like, no, but it's right that there are, but you know, there are people who read Margaret Mitchell and think that that's the way the old South was too. You know, hmm. I mean, but that's that's again, that's why no matter what side you're on, spend more time reading the other side yeah. because that that's going to give you a better better look. You know, Margaret. We yeah. saw Margaret Mitchell's grave. She did. Sa- sadly was hit by a car and died. People realize how she how she died. She stumbled off the happened. sidewalk and hit by a car in Atlanta. God. Um, but that's that's the reality of that. But no, but it's good. But it's good. So yeah. we can we can rant on that. People will rant on that all day long. But yes, yeah. Twitter, um, but Twitter yeah, we, we um, it was the anniversary of Chancellorsville this week, and I don't know. I you and I were talking about this this morning, I think, and I said, did you notice that like all anybody talked about was Stonewall Jackson's wounding? Yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a well, lot. That, I'm like, wasn't there a battle? You know, no. Well, that was a, that was a, it was a big. I mean, it was a big deal. Uh, it, it's it's it's. I think when people think of Chancellorsville, I think that's probably the first thing a lot of people think of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you're going out to that wounding site, you know, you certainly want to, you certainly want to go to the site, which is right next to the visitor center. You want to take a ride to 1781 Brewery, yep. get a few beers where he had his. He said he off. was going there today. Oh, lucky bastard! You know, and then you go over to Elwood and you go see the stone where his arm is buried. You go visit yeah. that too. And if no one's around, you can jump that fence, take a picture. Of we did that. Yep. Yeah, but that's a lot of cool places to go up there. But yeah, there's coming to that season again where in the, that area, for those who have not been to that Chancellorsville area, you've got battlefields that overlap. Yeah. With you know the, the you know wilderness and in Chancellorsville and Spotsylvania and all these places, Fredericksburg. So you can kind of go out there and see. Um, and it's confusing when you sit there and see you driving through chancellorsville and you see a monument you see a, a marker for u.s grant you go what the hell and then you realize it's just, they, they're interpreted differently yeah um 
we'll be re- we'll be doing an episode uh, on Spotsylvania. Yeah, that's our next episode. In, in Spotsylvania, I, I think I don't think people realize um, what an absolute shit show that one was. And and you know, people will talk about the fact it's the second biggest battle Overland campaign, but really. It, it 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 signified the big difference of the you know of U.S. Grant strategy, where usually after the wilderness just happens, and it's kind of a draw. They both get yeah. their nose bloodied. Lee is going wants to fight there because he's got less men and he can use the woods to help mass the numbers and, and even the odds. But he's expecting after the battle Grant to go lick his wounds for a few months like everybody else did. Yeah. But instead, he's going to go around on the left. And try to get a spot on your courthouse. And Lee's yeah. like, holy shit, this guy, you know, and it leads to that, that vicious battle of Spotsylvania. Uh, and, and, and when you look at, and everyone talks about Emory Upton and his, you know, his, when he fisted the Confederate yeah. line, right? So, so wow, that's that how he, that, terrible. That's, that's exactly how he phrased it. Wow. Um, and so uh, I'll let you, let you use your imagination on that one. But, but that battle went on for days. That was on May 8th. Yeah, it and ended then, on like yeah. the 18th or 19th. Right, or right. Like a couple days, a couple a few days later. Yeah, and it in when you look at in in this is one where if you we've talked we've talked a million times about the three the big three things that screw you on battles, right? Yep. Communication, weather, and terrain. Yep. Spotsy gets all three. Poor mm-hmm. Francis Barlow, Mary. We're going to have to talk about him. Yeah. MJ MJ's not going to want to hear this, but this was not Hancock's greatest moment, giving out orders in this battle. No, I think we're, Barlow we're, got we're, pretty pissed we're, off. You, at him. You've you've got Barlow walking in the morning at four o'clock in the morning in the dark in mm. the mist with no plans. The two guides that Hancock hires to lead them to the line have never been there before. Yeah. So it's like you walking over from the bar in the dark by yourself, don't know where the hell you're going. Oh, and it ends up they they see the ridge, they attack the ridge, and they they yeah. think they've won the battle, and they realize, oh shit, that was just a picket line. Now we got to go to now we got to go to the freaking mule shoe. Yeah, and it's inter- It's just an interesting battle. You know, John Brown Gordon's there. You know who's who actually probably deserves a lot of credit for spots of A is Yule. Yeah, right. Uh, and Allegheny Johnson. Uh, and so, and this is what there's so many great stories about this battle. Um, it's you know, a- a- John- Allegheny Johnson gets gets captured, mm-hmm. and he's friends with Hancock. Yeah, and George Maryland Stewart gets captured, and he's also knows Hancock. They get brought behind the line. And Johnson's all teary eyed. He's like, I can't believe I got caught. But Stewart's all like, he's all pissed off. Yeah. And he and um, and so Hancock goes to see Allegheny Johnson and says, Oh, great to see you again. He's like, Oh, good to see you, blah, blah, blah. And um, Hancock goes to Stewart and says, Well, he sticks out his hand and goes, Good to see you too. And he goes, I'm not shaking your hand under the under these circumstances. And then oh, Hancock, then Hank Hancock says, Well, this is the only circumstances I would ever shake your hand. And then they get led to the back. He lets Johnson ride a horse like yeah. they usually do, and says, "Stewart, you can walk." Oh. So he makes land. He makes Maryland strong. So, there, so there's a lot of cool stories like this with Spotsylvania. We'll talk about, but but if you if you visited um, if you visited the um, the battlefield, and it, it's it's a fascinating, beautiful, gorgeous of all the battlefields I've been to, Spotsylvania is probably the probably the most pristine because there's mm. really no monuments. Yeah. Um, the McCool house is gone, but you can still see where the foundation is, but there's really not much to it. There's a couple of monuments, a little bit of the mule shoe, but you can, for the most part, you can walk that line yeah. that Upton did and see almost exactly what he did. Isn't that cool? You can yeah. see that. And, um, but, it, it, but it's good though. But, the, but these stories are what make these battles really, really cool. And so we, yeah. we have spot spots. He's a fun one. Admittedly it is. Yeah. I'm looking forward to doing it. And then after that, we're going to be talking tickets mills. We're going to be going back out in the Western theater and looking at one of the probably most horrific battles of the Atlanta campaign that doesn't get studied a lot. Chloe Chan just said rededicate some monuments to Buster Kilrain. Well, Buster's got a few of them. Buster's got a few. Got a, <laughs> Good morning, it, was Lisa. Nice, it was nice that somebody carved his name into that 20th Main monument. Someone finally did that. Oh, God. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, but, um, but, but it's, yeah, it's neat, though. Spot, Spotsy's going to be fun to do. And then, yeah, I, I am looking forward to doing Pickett's Mills a lot. Um, not just because Howard's there. It's not his best day. Well, well, Spotsylvania signifies a real change in strategy yeah. for the Union. Yeah. You know, like we said before, where instead of falling back, they keep attacking. And he keeps going on around to the left. And the other thing that's a big change, too, is this is where Grant really gets it on Lee, yeah. where Lee, Lee is still thinking the goal is to capture Richmond. 
hit. And at this point, Grant's wants to capture Lee. Yeah. And so uh, that's why Spotsylvania happens. You know who else had a great day at Spotsylvania too is Jeb Stewart. Yeah. And what's funny, and what this did too, is when you look how battles change, change history. And we'll talk about this when we record the episode, but you have he sends out Phil Sheridan, who sucks. Yeah. He does, right? He's, he's Sheridan sucks. I mean, he has his moments, but he's, you know, whatever. Yeah, Sheridan's kind of overrated. So Meade, because he's still in charge of the um, of you know, Army of the Potomac, yeah. to send the cavalry out to kind of go screen towards spot, yeah. spots of the courthouse. And they end up basically just kind of like hanging out and chilling and not moving. Yeah. So Meade finds them, and Sheridan's not even there. And the, the men are all kind of sleeping and hanging out, the cavalry guys. And me loses his shit on Sheridan. But the problem I is Sher- have seen that. But, but, but Sheridan's friends with, with Grant. And he yeah, says, he's like Grant's little lap dog. Right. So he's like, I need to get the hell out of here. This is ridiculous. Yeah. So Grant says, all right, what do you want to do? He goes, let me go chase. Let me go fuck around and see if I can get Jeb to follow me. And he does. And that leads to Battle Yellow Tavern. Which but leads that's, to Jeb Stewart death. Right. But it also, right, but it also leads to the Union having no cavalry in Spotsylvania, which is going to be huge. But again, all, these things, these personalities of these guys, how it affects history. Oh, so yeah. how, many, how many soldiers on the Union side died to get Stuart, if you think about it? Yeah. If you really, if you, and it, it just, it just, when you look at these, these little things, these personality clashes, how it changes history, how it costs lives. But there's a, there's a lot of that. But um, Francis Barlow will get us get a lot of mentions with this one because he certainly uh, had a lot of stuff to do. Yeah. So will John um, Brown Gordon. Yeah, Gordon, you know, Gordon, it's it's a uh, it's a fascinating story about him, too. This is probably one of his better moments. Yeah. And, and it wasn't it wasn't anything specifically that Hancock did bad. It was just that Gordon when when after that first set of attacks after uh, Upton does his thing. What happens is Lee, I mean, Grant is going to bring everyone together. He's going to bring the whole army together. And Lee hears about this movement and he thinks, okay, what's Grant doing? He's moving again. He's yeah. going around my left or around my right. So he takes the, he takes the artillery and starts moving it towards Spotsylvania Courthouse because that road junction. Yeah. And beca- and, but he's not moving. He's just reformulating. So now they're going to attack again. Um, except this time, because Lee pulls the artillery, they, the Confederates are really short on guns. And that's what really cost him on this one. Yeah. So Grant really, st- the strategy in this one really pants Lee on this one. Um, but it's a, it's a fun, this battle has got like Gettysburg, Chancellorsville, and Fredericksburg all rolled into one. Yeah, we'll like talk all about the mistakes. The, uh, yeah, we'll yeah, talk about we'll, the episode. We'll, we'll talk about the episode. But, but there are so many little things where... Um, Lee probably should remember Pickett's charge a little bit uh, with this one and, and little things like that. There are, there are a lot of comparisons we can make. So, but if you haven't been to the battlefield, go check it out. It's, 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 it's amazing there. It's amazing there. Um, yeah. And the other thing too, like we talked about the, um, the Chancellorsville anniversary and I was expecting like a lot more Howard hate and there wasn't, it was all about Stonewall Jackson's arm. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. This is a change from the year before where, it was like, oh my God, Howard sucks. But I did get a couple of those, you know, um, the Howard. Well, you, the well Howard you, I mean, Howard. I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean, you, unfortunately, I think there are people who, you know, who look at you and just they automatically think Howard. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. But, uh, but you open yourself up a little bit to it. But a lot of times it goes yeah. back to what we were saying earlier, people who, who don't really who study this, who, who don't realize that Howard relinquished command of the 11th Corps to Carl Scherz at Gettysburg, yep. that he wasn't in charge of that retreat through the town. But again, it's Howard. And so people will, will fall in the line with yep. that. Well, I had um, one guy tweet at me and he was like, yeah, Howard like ran at Chancellorsville and then he would have been routed at Gettysburg too if Hancock hadn't come in and saved the day. And I just responded and said, congratulations, you've seen the movie. I mean, how yeah. many how many people, I mean, is, is look Stonewall his it was the you know the third time that Lee separated his army in the face of the Union which was a huge huge thing for that but he had twenty thousand plus guys yeah how many how many corps have you know have Union corps have twenty thousand men so you could have put you could have put anybody in that flank it was wrong place wrong time for Howard yeah not to, and you got Sickles talking in his ear about how they were retreating so there's a lot of things in play with yeah. this. 
And like, it's not course, his greatest moment. I mean, he ignores Von Gilsa. Um, you know, and oh, there's some comments here. Uh, Caleb said the soldier diaries accounts of Spotsylvania are insane. It'll make you glad you weren't there. AQ says Barlow is happy to be back with the second corps in 1864. MJ says she likes Gordon. Uh, Frank said mule shoe reminds uh, me of the Franklin assault. And I learned that there were some union officers that were both at the mule shoe and Franklin. Well, the thing about the mule oh. shoe was, and in, in, in this is this is where you get Hancock credit. He attacks, um, you, you know what time they attack? 420. Wow. That's the, time, that's the time they attack, right? And the reason why they had to delay was because there was so much rain and there was so much mist they couldn't see. And it's been raining all night. And the Confederates, you primarily right at the mule shoe, they are they have some men on the line, but they're thinking the union's going around their right. So they're just kind of hanging in the artillery's kind of gone, they're chilling, yeah. but it's pouring out. So here comes Barlow right up the savannah yeah they're hitting them right the confederates go to fire guess what happens nothing because the guns yeah. are wet the, mm -hmm. the, the, the gunpowder is soaking wet so yeah. they get routed back and gordon's going to push them back again um but this was uh this was a battle i think you mentioned frank and frank mentioned this is a battle you don't want to be at this yeah and yeah the, caleb the other, mentioned that too the, the yeah. other thing that's so underrated with this is the death of Sedgwick. And we joke about it, the elephant man, all that elephant shit. Man, yeah. But but I don't think people realize, you know, if you read Grant's memoirs, he says right in the memoirs, he, you know, losing him was it was one of the biggest things that happened. It sounds a lot like Lee talking about Jackson dying. Yeah. Now he's sitting there at the end, and he has there's a monument there where he got shot, and he's riding his horse, and this this sharpshooter shooting at him, and the bullets are falling, and the artillery guys are ducking, they're hiding. Yep. And he, and he's joking, saying, Oh, what do you guys? What do you guys do? They're not going to hit you here. And he has, he famously says they couldn't hit an elephant okay. at this distance. Yeah. A second later, he gets shot right under the left eye, and drops him. God. But that, that, but not only did that psychologically completely damage uh, his men, but now you got Horatio Rice, who's yeah. going to have to take over that sixth corps, who just went from a single A to the majors. Don't forget too that the Confederacy was without James Longstreet. Because yeah. he got wounded in wilderness a couple of days before too. Yeah. So you have a lot of these men coming up. And if you read if you read Gordon's memoirs, he talks about the fact that he was so against Lee pulling the artillery out. And you have to maintain that, that mule shoe line. Yeah. Um, but again, it's all communication. Yeah. But there are so many moving parts because they weren't used to fighting battle this quickly mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, so you lose Sedgwick and you lose Longstreet. Uh, within a couple of days, and how that threw a, a monkey wrench in a, both armies. Yeah, uh, but it's a fascinating study. It's it's a it's a oh, bloody, it brutal. By twenty two mm. consecutive hours of fighting, the longest sustained fighting in the Civil War. Twenty two hours in That's the not, rain, fighting in the rain in the mud. No, thank no, you. No, thanks. No. Thanks. no um, <laughs> James mentions he likes your video of you Howard running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was a couple of years ago. That, that was um that was fun. That, uh, what's great, you know, what's great about visiting these battlefields is you you can go to the sites of where these things happened, and you, you yeah. can have you can have fun with it. You really, really can. Um, yeah. and, and so, yeah, I appreciate appreciate that. That was a uh, there might have yeah. been a few beers involved in that video, if I'm correct. Right. Right. Um, he also yeah. mentions, and I got to go find where this is, but James James mentions too that Chris White wasn't too kind to Howard. And I mean, I get it. Chancellorsville is not his greatest moment. He makes mistakes. Um, Howard's, you know, and this is like, um, I have Carpenter's biography about Howard, which I need to return to the library before they accuse me of stealing it. Um, by the way, librarians, we are the worst at returning books. We don't return them on time. Um, but anyway, um, it's a Carpenter has a really balanced biography of Howard. Now the civil war only takes up like the first 80 or 90 pages. That's it. The rest of it is his career, you know, in Freeman's bureau out West and all that. But he said that one of like, you know, he humanizes Howard, Howard. And he says that one of Howard's faults was the fact that he could never admit when he was wrong. He hated being wrong. And that's like, no one likes, no one likes to be I mean, wrong. I'm like that too. You know, it's like, I mean, you tell me I'm wrong all the time. What? what the fuck? I don't tell my story. Oh God! One of the most disturbing accounts of Mule Shoe was that someone saw a guy get hit by a cannonball, and his headless body was running around. Afterwards. Yeah, um, yeah. Frank, email us that source, please. Thank you. No, there's a lot of there's a lot of stories like that. Um, but you can, you know what's what's really cool about Spotsylvania is you can go 
um, on the big anniversaries, the one fiftieth, the one sixtieth. You can do the you can do battlefield tours with Rangers um, at the same time they march. So you 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 meet at like three in the morning and you start marching with Barlow's guys through the woods, uh, and you you get to see it almost exactly the same time. But can you imagine you're those soldiers, those Union guys? And, and the Confederates talked about seeing all the birds flying out of the trees. They yeah. knew they were coming. It was like Chancellorsville. And they hit that picket line, that ridge, and they think they solved it. The Confederates are gone. We solved it. And then they look up and they look further down that field towards a mule shoe. And they, they talk about seeing the, the overturned dirt on top of the hill. And they go, oh, yeah. shit, we're in the wrong place. And there's a ravine. And yeah. the Union troops are running through. To um to get to the to get to the mule shoe in the Confederate artillery, what's left is shooting over them because they're firing at the trees because yeah. they can't see them. Um, it's a complete mess. But if you go, you can walk that same field uh, and you can walk that same ground and you can imagine. And because because for the most part, it's it's there's no monuments you can really see. But Hancock Hancock is There's a couple of things about this. Yeah, MJ he, mentions he, that he was he, wounded. He, he, like, he just he, got he, he just got back. He he just got back. He who knows if he still had his uh, McDonald's diet going at that point. Who, you know who knows. You know, no, I'm kidding. But he but he talked. His plans to Barlow was we want you to focus on a house. He was talking about the McCool house. Yeah. But he goes, I hear there's a white house behind their line. So he doesn't know there is, but he's hearing rumors. He goes, that's what I want you to focus on. He goes, well, we're not sure there even is a house, and that's where we're going. And we're gonna walk in the dark and the rain. Are you sure? He goes, I'm going to give you some guides, but they haven't been there before either. So we don't know. So take 20,000 guys a go. That's... And this is, and this is all because of Upton's success mm-hmm. a couple of days before breaking mm-hmm. through that line. Now this is not a shot on Hancock because this is, again, it's all communication, but that's how messed up this battle was. Yeah. And, and, and so right off the bat, you're, you know, you're Grant, you've lost Sedgwick. You've got Horatio right now. You've, you've got a lot of these young up and coming guys. And this is, one of the most brutal battles again 22 consecutive hours of fighting took place at the mule shoe yeah. it is probably the most violent place on earth in america anyway mm-hmm. especially in america for the you know, forget picket's charge forget the, the wheat field you yeah. know forget you know forget the you know the cornfield in antietam the mule shoe is is where the rubber hits the road with with ground with ground zero of civil war fighting combat it, it's, it's just and it's and if you go there now it's like the garden of eden it is the most yeah. peaceful looking place but but that's that's really uh the blood and carnage just picture these guys fighting in the mud and the rain yeah. it's pouring down and, and just hand-to-hand combat you know mano a mano yeah. um and, and that's 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 what Spotsylvania was and for some reason it gets overshadowed a lot by things like cold harbor yeah by the by the wilderness by other aspects of the overland campaign mm-hmm. but Spotsy was was the one it really was yeah like aq mentions that barlow was pissed about the poor communication lack of reliable information in a way like where they end up reminds me of billy goat hill with missionary ridge how sherman ends up on that wrong hill and he's got to like go down into the ravine and that allows Pat Claiborne to get the advantage on them. But, but you know, the, well, it's, it's the thing about it though, is where they had to go for Spotsylvania was the ridge was in front of them. So they come through the woods and you, you emerge from the woods and there's a ridge and there's Confederates on the ridge, admittedly, they get chased off. The last thing I expected to see was union troops at that point. Yeah. Cause they thought they were, they thought they were retreating because Lee's like, well, this is what they do. Grant's moving again, so let's move all our artillery over to our right, mm-hmm. and that creates that gap yeah. where Emory had come through before. So it's like, well, they're moving, so we're just going to stand here and hang out. And Gordon's like, "Don't freaking move! Don't take the guns! I'm this is they're not moving, they're not leaving, they're redeploying." I'm telling mm-hmm. you, and and so when they came through, they burst with that first line, and they're thinking this was it because they're under the impression too, because they knew the artillery was leaving yeah. that they Confederates were moving too. So they thought this was going to be a milk run, yep. but you know, and, and then everything, in, everything that went after that was just brutal. And it is a famous story, and you know, uh, where Robert E. Lee himself rides up to the front of the line. Yeah, and and, and it, it's it's and this is one of those great soldier stories, those great diary stories. Do you remember the movie Gettysburg? Yeah, when he when, when he rides up and was going Lee Lee Lee. Well, here comes Robert E. Lee and Gordon saying, "Get the." Fuck out of here! Yeah. You can't. You can't be up front. And 
all the soldiers are start chanting, Lee, go, Lee, go, yeah. Lee, go. And it's the opposite of the movie. And he finally turns and he takes off, but Gordon makes him leave the field. And all the soldiers are chanting for Lee to get the hell out of there because yeah. they don't want to see their guy go down. Yeah. Um, and so it's, 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 it's that mass confusion in the rain, in the yeah. early dawn, the dark, and it goes on for almost a full day. So it's, yeah. just, it's, just a, it's just a great, it's a great soldier story battle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm looking for, I found an article that talks specifically about the weather at Spotsylvania. Mm-hmm. It's like a 20 page article that was written in 2021. So I'm going to read that. That is one of my sources to see what they say about it. But yeah, it is a, you know, and like you said, going there, it's a beautiful, pristine place to visit. Um, but, you know, mule shoe, like that fighting that's there, you know, kind of reminds me of like, in some ways, it's like the brutal fighting at Pickett's Mills, too. Like, that is another one. The next battle we're going to be talking about, that is one that, you know, Sherman has a sentence about it, and that's it. Um, well, I mean, meanwhile, well, Ambrose Bierce writes a thing called The Crime of Pickett's Mills, because, like, at that point, you know, and this doesn't get talked a lot about with the Atlanta campaign, is that, you know, Sherman's subordinates are questioning him, um, especially Thomas, you know, right. after Kennesaw saying... Sherman's like, well, I guess we didn't lose too many men. And Thomas was like, are you kidding? If we have any more days like that, we're going to like, we're going to lose more. Like we're going to lose too many. Like we're throwing them to a meat grinder kind of thing. Um, Howard's memoirs, he, he talks a lot about um, Pickett's Mills. And he says, you know, I fought at Gettysburg and I fought, you know, Antietam and I fought at Chancellorsville. And I've never seen anything as horrific as what I saw at Pickett's Mills kind of thing. Like it was. No, like, Pickett's, Pickett's Mills is you go there and you look at that ravine and you, you that slope down with the water and the slope back up. And you sit there and say, you know, with all the engineers in the army, couldn't they find a better place to fight than this? But that's but the Confederates had that had that great ground. Claiborne's guys yeah. up there. Uh, Hiram Granberry's up there. All the big heavy hitters from the army of Tennessee and Howard, who, you know, who doesn't have the reputation of being offensive at all. Mm. You know, he, he ends up um, having to maneuver this attack on Claiborne. So you're going up against probably, I think we both agree that he used he used the best general the Confederate army had as far as the whole package. And he's going up against them. And if you look at the, it's like Culp's Hill is a milk run compared to, to Pickett's mill. And it's no surprise they got they got their asses whipped because yeah. I don't think you know I don't think there's an army on the planet who's going to take who's going to take that ground. It's impossible, no. and that's another battlefield that that's unchanged. Yeah, it, you, you can know. go there, you can see, and you like you question like what the hell like was he thinking like why? And the same with Kennesaw when you go out and look um, over that uh, Caleb asks, is it similar to Ball's Bluff? Ball well, Ball's Bluff is much better ground as far as fighting. Uh, He's about Pickett's Mill, I assume. Pickett Pickett's Mill is like um, it's like two hills that come down like yeah, this. Yes, very right. Yeah. And, and so you have to come down this slope and there's water coming through this. We're doing very good, by the way, at this one demonstration, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you have to come right back up like this. And yeah. this is all heavily wooded. Ball's Bluff has that rise from the Potomac, which is really, really cool. That um, Edward Baker's those guys had to climb up. Mm-hmm. But once you get to the top of that cemetery, is it's just flat ground. So yeah. it's good fighting ground. Uh, there's no field to pick its mill. It's all in the woods around a stream with a deep ravine that, that affects it. So yeah. um, it's like, it's almost like picture big round top for the Gettysburg people, but you have to come down big round top and then go right back up again. There's water that yeah. goes right in the middle of it. That, that's Pickett's mill. And so uh, it's a it's a brutal battlefield. It just, it just is. Um, when we were, you and I were walking the grounds there uh, and they were very happy to see us. I don't think too they many were. people go in there. No. Oh my God. Oh my God, people. People. So, you know, we went in there, walked around and checked out. The, they, they gave us the tour, the whole little behind the stuff, behind the scenes. You see all their cool stuff. I they know. Had. They had the library there that somebody donated and, and all, like, it was really, really cool. And yeah. um, it said, MJ said, good use of Confederate cavalry at Pickett's Mills harassing the Union. It, it, it goes, that whole thing goes back to ground and it's a great defensive position. It's a horrible offensive position. It just, yeah, hurts. it's Howard um, was in, again, he's in a very bad place, but also it's not his best day. It's certainly not Sherman's best day. Howard's not in charge of the army at this point either. He's still, yeah. I think in our, he's still a division commander or corps commander in army of Cumberland. 
So this right. is before McPherson's been taken out. This is before Battle of Ezra Church when he's in charge of the army. Um, and it's not his best day, but his writing, like, I mean, his writing about it, like, is just like some of the stuff he says is how he's laying on the ground and he can hear the soldiers around him dying. Yeah. And and he like is like, no, this is the worst fighting I've ever seen. And he kept saying he said that a lot about the Atlanta campaign, that it was just this, it was a whole new ball game in the Western theater. First well, fight. Western theater, I mean, I, I think people think Western theater of fighting in the woods and all that stuff. Every, most battlefields in the West, for the most part, except for one, certain places, places like Shiloh, places like that, were in the, it was like the wilderness. It was, it yep. was woods. I think people go to Gettysburg and they think every battlefield is a big, wide open plain. You can see for miles and, or in Tetum or, uh, or Monocacy or any of those ones in that area. But um, you had to be a special type to fight in the West. There's no question. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they were rugged, you know, in, in, in the weather was brutal. And so that's, that, that's how it was. It, it's, unf it's really unfair to, to blast or praise a lot of these people. Cause a lot of this stuff is just dumb luck anyway. Yeah. As far as yeah. It's goes. not, it's not, I mean, like I said, like Howard made his mistakes at Chancellorsville, but um, he's anybody would have, I think anybody in that position would have been routed. Even John Reynolds, you know, as good as he was, even George Meade, as, as good as he was, like, would have been routed in that position. It's a terrible position. and But he learned from it. That's the thing, is Howard learned from it. And yeah. he didn't make that mistake again. No, me, me you know, obviously, me, the cantankerous, grumpy, you know, whole deal. Um, but he, he going back, talking about Overland again, that campaign, it, it must have been a tough spot for him because he was theoretically still the, the boss, yeah. But here comes Grant and he brings in Sheridan and he's used to dealing with guys like Buford, yeah. people like that. Now he brings in this miserable prick Sheridan um, who is very, you know, we have, we have fun with Sheridan, Cedar Creek and, and, and yeah. you know, it's a Stones River. He has success. But but on the overrated side, he's certainly a capital O as far yeah. as, we, as, as much yeah. as we want to have fun with Jackson with that thing. I mean, I don't think there's anybody more overrated than Sheridan on the Union side if you really think yeah. about it. Um, but he, you know, he was able to go behind his back, you know, to talk to, to Grant yeah. and, and Grant had his binkies. He did Sherman, certainly Sheridan, um, and he, Rollins. he, he Rollins, you know, but you were either in his doghouse or his penthouse, you know, Rosecrans found out the hard way. Right. And but, if but, you got stuck in his doghouse, you never came out again. Oh yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, I mean, like that's how, the thing Grant could hold a fucking grudge, like a 13 year old teenage girl, like. And you had you had uh, you had disasters like George Stoneman. You had some shitty cavalry yeah. in the middle. You, you did right. Um, not not everybody is going to be is going to be Ben Grierson. Be honest, okay. Yeah. But um, Sheridan and I wonder if that that in that gap between the wilderness and Spotsylvania, when Meade has his has had his issues with Sheridan. If it was if, if he sent Sheridan out towards what ultimately turned into the Battle of Yellow Tavern just to get him away from Meade. But mm -hmm. if he did, if Grant did that and he knew he was going to, he was going to go to uh, spots of courthouse to try to take that road junction. Yeah. He really screwed me because he left him with zero cavalry because he yeah. took it all. He took all of it. He's like, you with the beer in the fridge, you took every one of them. What? And so he had, he had to fight that battle with, with no horse he's married. Yeah. None. Yeah. Um, Caleb said, imagine how veterans of Lee's army at Fredericksburg would think about being at Missionary Ridge. Quite the difference. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. like there. Um, AQ said, speaking of level of confusion at the bloody at the bloody angle, one point Barlow is reported to have yelled back, "For God's sakes, Hancock, do not send any more troops here." So th there's a there's a far but a mile behind back, and that was kind of their staging point. They all had to meet there around midnight the night before that the second attack. And Upton's raid was the was the first. That wasn't the whole yeah. thing. As much as you you go there and see the monuments for Upton, that was. So he, what happens is Sedgwick goes down, writes the man. So Upton says, I want to do something different. How about instead of attacking shoulder to shoulder, we force our men into a line and we fist them. That's the phrase he yes. used. Go right through the um, middle. And yeah. burst. He goes, I want a Kool-Aid man right through that line. I want to get through. Well, what, what are you going to do when you get through the line? I don't know, but it's never been done before, but I want to try it. 
Grant says, you know what? It's just crazy enough to work. Let's yeah. do it. So he does it. He bursts through the line and it works. But predictably, he can't stay there. And he goes back and he, he and then Grant, his sister, he says, shit, I was able to burst that line with 6,000 guys. What if I did it with 20,000? What would happen? Does that sound a lot like Ambrose Wright and Pickett's charge in reverse? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what he does. And so he formulates that Hancock plan to take 20,000 guys, go mm-hmm. through that gap against the mule shoe, except this time the Rebs are ready for it. But it's funny how history repeats itself. And oh, that's what that Get- yeah. the Gettysburg comparison is, is, is Grant didn't learn his lesson from what happened with, with that. Wright gets to the angle at, at Gettysburg. Lisa's shit. If he can get there, if I send the entire shooting match to that spot in the middle, I can have more success. Grant does the same thing in Spotsylvania. Yeah. And he gets his ass handed to him. Yeah. And that's uh, and that's 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 history for you. Yeah. You know, that's why yeah. you that's why you gotta learn your history. You gotta pay yeah. attention. <laughs> uh Frank said, speaking of the wilderness, I just rewatched a movie called Wicked Spring. It's about Union and Confederate soldiers setting up camp together in the wilderness darkness. Low budget but fun movie. Uh James says listening to Dandy Dan Sickles was Howard's biggest mistake at Chancellor's Phil. Yeah, well, I mean Sick- okay. Sickles. PAQ, was... thanks for stopping by. Hey, good to see you. Um, you know, Sickles, he I mean. He thought he was right. Yep. He thought he was, and um, you know, you know, vacating Hazel Grove was was a, was a mistake. He certainly knew that, and uh, Fairview was a mistake, and uh, that whole thing was a complete disaster. I mean, you want to talk about a missed opportunity is what that one was because uh, Hazel Grove. God, well, I mean, Hooker from the beginning was a it was yep. a big mess. Yep. He, he has a chance to route them. He stops. Then yep. he gets cocked. He gets. He gets conked in the head. He gets and concussed. Sees, and, and sees butterflies flying around for the next couple hours. <laughs> That's and, pinwheel, right? Meanwhile, Meade is ready to fight Stuart, who now is in charge of the infantry because Stonewall's yeah. gone. And he has him over a barrel and Meade, and hate, he hates Stuart. He wants to beat his ass. Yeah. And he's saying, guy, please attack for Christ's sakes. And Hooker's like, do, 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 do. Yeah. And all that time goes by and they end up getting beat. Uh, it's, re- it's really for the union side, a really unfortunate uh, schedule of, uh, of events. Yeah. Uh, but well, for Lee, he finds himself in a similar position to what he was in at Fredericksburg when he almost he, got Stonewall and he couldn't no, get reinforcements. He was. And, and Lee's going to look at Chancellorsville as a big mistake, too, because he, he knew that every battle that went on, that he didn't completely eliminate that army was yeah. lost. Because, I mean, you had diminishing numbers. You had less people. Uh, you, you, so you had to you had to you had to focus on that. And people look at it as like that's Lee's greatest battle. It probably was from the outsider, but mm. he wouldn't tell you that. He, he, no. would, he would tell you that it was his biggest loss opportunity. Yeah. Well, like I said, I, I think we've said before that a lot of these guys, if you could go back and ask them, what was the biggest battle you fought in? You know, veteran, you would think veterans of Gettysburg, like might make the assumption, oh, they're going to say Gettysburg. Well, I mean, I always use the example of John Brown Gordon. I think if you were to ask him, what was the most significant battle you fought in? He's going to tell you Monocacy because he even told um, Lou Wallace, you stopped us. You slowed us down, you know. Well, most people, and you see this with sports sometimes too, a lot of their greatest, you know, generals or even athletes, their greatest memories of the what are the other losses, not the wins. Because, because you know, a loss hurts more than a win feels good. Yeah, in a lot of cases, and and that and that's the truth with a lot of this. That that that, that explains a lot yeah. of Gordon, a lot of early and stuff like that. Yeah, but that's but yeah. because you know Monocacy is this small nondescript battle. It seems that nobody visits. By the way, if you're in Gettysburg, go visit Monocacy. It's like forty five minutes away. It's amazing. It's pristine. But you know, apparently he and Barlow, or not Barlow, he and Lou Wallace were out for dinner one time after the war, mm-hmm. um, and you know Lou Wallace was like, "Oh, you kicked my ass at uh, you know." there at uh, monocacy and um gordon was like you kidding you stopped us like you slowed us down you slowed us down from doing this thing you know and it's true and that's how gordon saw it gordon didn't see it as some kind of victory he you know saw it as uh this thing well he saw it as, he saw it as a missed opportunity a missed opportunity yep. just like we were saying with chances with, with lee i mean if he doesn't get stalled at monocacy and gets over that bridge and he gets to washington I mean, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't probably doesn't affect the war, but it certainly puts it puts a crimp in Lincoln's dick is what that does. Yeah. If he gets to Washington, because yeah. it's going to affect politically. It's going to cause all kinds of issues. But again, he doesn't think of I mean, Gordon's greatest moment certainly is probably Gettysburg day one. Yeah. Certainly, certainly the, the mule shoe, probably. I mean, if you look at that, it was more inconclusive. But he um, Gordon didn't lose a lot, though. 
He really did. Gordon didn't. is like one of the Gordon's like Patrick Claiborne in the Eastern Theater. He's one of these guys that constantly learned from his mistakes. And he's I mean, also not the thing with Gordon, too, like Patrick Clay. Well, Patrick Claiborne was in the British Army, so he's got some military training. I mean, you can make a case that Stedman was a loss for Gordon, but that really wasn't his. I mean, that, that was so late. But for the most part, Gordon was he he, he did a lot of winning. All, all he yep. did was win no matter what, you know, yep. for the most part, he did. Um but when you look at some of these battles, Spotsylvania, it, it, the, the carnage, the death on the on these battles. I mean, yeah. uh, the Overland campaign is a complete because this is this is the thing where where Grant decides, you know, something instead of Richmond, I'm going to attack Grant. I've got more men. I'm just going to throw them all to the meat grinder yeah. and I'm wear them down. I'm going to win this by attrition. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of messing with this guy. I'm just going to keep going at him. And, and it just caused such a disaster. You know, with yeah. with uh, with because you know when you look at and what what a mess that whole thing created, just as far as these people dying and the injuries and stuff like that, it, it's it's a uh, it's it's horrible. Like that story Frank told about the guy with the cannonball running around yeah. without his head, um, but that that happens a lot. There's a good story like that um, that Rufus Dawes talks about when he was charged in a railroad cut at Gettysburg, yeah, where he didn't understand why a guy's legs are still moving with no head until he finally fell down. Yeah. Um, oh, God. And, yeah, it's, it's, well, there's that, like in Howard's memoirs, the, the when he mentions Pickett's Mills, he talks about eyeless, like soldiers without eyes. Like he he describes the the injuries, and it's like, how, like how did this? You know, if he's seeing this, so are other people. How do you deal with that? You know, well, well, the ama- the amazing thing about about a lot of these battles is is the Civil War taught the united states a lot about how to deal with soldier deaths i mean don't forget too there were no dog tags till world war one no so you had no way of identifying people and it, it was really bad you know it there was a, until there was a there was a general order 33 it was april of 1862 was the first time that the the government said well report your death numbers or who they are to us but there was no mechanism for re, for letting families know no but the government kept track of Joe Smith was killed at the Battle of Fredericksburg or whatever it was. But the, until that Order 33 came down, there was there was no way to deal with it. Yeah. And it wasn't until that U.S. Christian Commission um, came in where they were having soldiers put in their in their shirts, their names yeah. um, in, a, in a little book. And a lot of the shit was stolen after they died. But there was no real government mechanism for 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 recognizing um, the dead and the injured. And there's a lot of stories where people, they think, you know, and then what happened was you had chaplains who would report to the media, the deaths, but only 40% of the union army had chaplains and less yeah. than that in the Confederacy. So those two, you had no way. And you had a lot of the families who were coming to visit, trying to find their dead and stories. There's good and bad stories. Is that one story of the guy who went on to, he became the, the owner of the New York Times later. I'm blank on his name right now. But he was told his son had died and he came to go retrieve his body. And he shows up and says, I'm here to see the you know, body of Joe Smith. Yeah. Okay, he's over here. He walks over. This Joe Smith sitting by the fire whittling. He was alive. And then there's, there's other stories where people, yeah. they went to go visit their sons and they, and they were dead. And, but there was no, this, this was the other thing, that, the other thing that doesn't get talked about a lot in this war is how to deal with the injured and how to deal with the dead yep. until Letterman came around with that triage system. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could just imagine the first half of the war with the mess of this. And, and those, those are the things that, um, that's why if you think about it, 30 to 40% of a union dead are unknown and even higher yeah. than that are Confederate dead. Are known. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Which is nuts. Like we'll never know the true, like how many were actually killed. Um, Caleb says the Overland campaign might be my favorite part of the war to study. It really fascinates me. And, Frank agreed and said all of 1864 is very fast. Well, the overly campaign is like a big hockey fight where the two guys just go and go and go and there's no break until they, one of them falls down. Where up until that point, you'd have a fight and they'd disengage. Yeah. They'd change around and fight. But this one was hit. Grand with, you know, wilderness. He fights. Yeah. Tries to go around Lee's left. Lee is going to see Spotsylvania Court because Lee's still thinking he's trying to get Richmond and not him. Yeah. He's going to he's going to send Jubal or he's going to send um, Jeb Stewart to defend those ridges to slow the Union down until they get to Spotsylvania. So by the time they get there, they're thinking it's just cavalry. Yeah. But then they realize they got infantry now. So it's like, oh, shit. Now what the hell is we doing? It's almost like Buford in reverse. 
Yeah. And so they fight there. He does disengage again, turns into the St. Anna thing. It, it goes and goes and goes, but there's no rest for the weary. There's no break until they no. get to Petersburg and it just turns into a siege. But I bet you Lee had, you know, had that moment when he realized this guy's not, he's not like everybody else back and off and, and giving us a chance to catch our yeah. breath. He's coming and he won't stop. Mm-hmm. Um, and as brutal and bloody as it was, uh, it probably did expedite the end of the war. It really did, yeah. especially with Wilmington falling and Fort Fisher yeah. and closing off the blockade areas. Um, but overall, it's something. I mean, that that's mm-hmm. just brutal. I mean, Vizzle's battlefields, a wilderness, and oh, people yeah. dying in the fire and burning. It's just, it's just, I it's know. just a shitty part of history if you really think about it. Yeah, and like I mean, and then yeah, at the same time as Overland, which I admittedly like, I'm starting to learn about it now, really for the first time. Like I've never, I've studied a little bit, but not a lot. So this is great for me. But you know, at the same time, Overland is happening. You have the Atlanta campaign happening, which is another huge thing. Yeah. Know? Yeah, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, and by that point, you know, you had the style of fighting different. You didn't have the, it was tough to stay in linear formation yeah. uh, because, because of the, the, the wilderness and the, and the woods. And, and so it changed, it changed warfare. It really turned from the Napoleonic yeah. style of fighting to that trench fighting. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I've, 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 I've said this a million times before, as brutal as the Civil War was, if this thing dillied around for another 30, 40, 50 years, and oh, the technology. Fought with, with World War I style weapons, with yeah. gas and planes, how brutal the Civil War could have been. Yeah. Um, but that's uh you had that that classic style of fighting, which was at the very end of that Napoleonic era, yeah. versus the beginning of the industrial stage where you had the, the rifle Princes, muskets, yeah. you, you had a different set of weapons, you had that high quality weapon against low quality tactics. Yeah, where you'd mash your men to mash your fire, and you ended up getting slaughtered. And yeah. that 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 was that was the thing. It, it, you can really look at the look at Bull Run and take it all the way to Appomattox or Benville, mm-hmm. and you can see this, how the how the style changed yeah. and how the American psyche changed towards war happened too. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, Frank mentions Gordon C. Ray's, Ray's book on Overland campaigns a must read. Yeah, it's it's that that's a good one it's good to break down the battles and take them individually um admittedly yeah. because you because you can read because oh, that book does a good job explaining how grant's philosophy changed and how the style yeah. changed and, and it really it really opened up i think the lincoln's eyes to the way to fight this yeah as brutal as it was because it led to you know the grant the butcher and all these nicknames yeah. things like that but um but then too, you know, like November of 64, you have you have the March to the Sea happening, which is yeah. also a war of attrition as well in a different way, admittedly. Um, I don't think Sherman burned a lot of the buildings that he's blamed. No, but Sherman's Sherman didn't have the didn't have the the fighting, you know, because a lot of a lot of the troops in Georgia at that point had been pulled away. So he was yeah. fighting the older people, the younger kids. He he really didn't fight a hell of a lot. He had a couple of skirmishes here and there. Griswold. Griswoldville was really the one that sticks out in mind. But he really he just it was really just finding food and finding finding supplies. Yeah. Um, but Overland though, it was it was the two heavyweights, you know, fighting yeah. without a break. You know, wasn't. Yeah. And it was and Grant, unlike his predecessors, said, "Fuck it, we we, we have to yeah. do it. We just have to do it." Yeah. Um, I don't think no. he gets enough credit as the commander of the AOP, though. He gets really overshadowed by Grant. Well, he he definitely got put in the corner because Grant, yeah. whatever, I mean, Meade is, you know, Meade is guilty in some historian circles of being slow up to Gettysburg. I think that's been debunked in a lot of cases, but yeah. that's certainly a reputation. And so not long after that is when, when Overland happens. So Grant has a reputation of having a success in the West and yeah. cap- capturing Vicksburg and un- unconditional surrender grant. He, he's that, he's the, he's the guy. Yeah. So he comes into, he comes over to the East to kind of, I don't want to say babysit me, but kind of oversee that army. Yeah. Well, cause but he doesn't want to be in Washington. No, but he's calling the shots though. Make no mistake mm-hmm. about it. He, you know, Grant is calling shots with this because it's Absolutely. very, you know, um, and he doesn't care. He's not intimidated by Lee. He's not worried by Lee. He knows what he wants to do. He wants to keep Lee on the move. He knows that he has more men and he yeah. knows he's just going to keep punching and punching and punching until he goes down. It's just a math equation. Yeah. They've got better, they've got better weapons. They've got more men. Lee has the benefit of being controlling the lands and fighting where he wants to fight. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was it. If he if you had yeah. the stomach to do what Grant did, you'd win. 
But not yeah. a lot of guys had the stomach. And I don't think anybody else probably would have won, could have done all the win except for U.S. No. Grant. And I mean, you look at the autonomy that he gives Sherman out in the Western theater in the Atlanta campaign too, tells me that, you know, there was a little bit of babysitting need going on. I don't think he had Sherman stayed out. Well, Sherman wanted Grant to stay out with him. He said, well, he knew, go to he, knew, he knew to keep, you know, like going to the Gettysburg movie, he knew to keep, separate the hotheads. Yeah. So he made sure that Sheridan was not around Meade. And so yeah. he, he calculated that, well, I can, and this is, this was, this was a big risk on him. And I don't think people realize what a risk he was taking was mm-hmm. to let Sheridan take that whole cavalry out across Virginia to try to draw Stewart out, yeah. knowing that he'd have no support, knowing he wasn't, that he was fighting. Yeah. Spot, he knew Spotsylvania was going to happen. He didn't think Lee was going to get there as quick as he did, but he knew no. he was going to get there. And so there was a big battle that was going to happen that would have, have that would have occurred without the use of cavalry. Yeah. And that was, and he, he weighed the options, figured, well, it's probably better off to do it this way. And that's what he did. Yep. Yeah. Jeb Stewart gets uh, shot by a Canadian. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the reality of it. I mean, yeah. granted, he gets lucky. I mean, if, if, you know, if the U.S., if the cavalry gets smoked out there and now, Lee realizes no cavalry and, and yeah. he's able to get Stuart back. And a lot of things could have been different. A lot of things could have been different, but, but like in history, sometimes you get lucky. Exactly. Yeah. Or bad, bad luck for the Confederacy. Yeah. But yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about them. Um, you know, the other thing too, to mention was that like, uh, this just popped in my head is that terrible general list we found on uh, Twitter. Last night. Oh yeah. You, you, someone, you, someone... you focus, you focus too much on Twitter. You worry no, too much about Twitter. No, I don't know. It was just, I was just bringing it up about the whole, like, the, it was ranking the generals and it was so bad yeah yeah it's, it's every, like everyone's entitled to their opinion okay yeah. there's no question about that but when but, you um, leave off john sedgwick and john reynolds and slocum and howard that's pretty yeah I, I think you know we mentioned sedgwick a little while ago i think sedgwick is so underrated yeah. as a general um I mean, not not for the actual contemporaries, certainly not for U.S. Grant, but I think historians look back now. Cedric is kind of he's vanilla. He's yeah. like Slocum. He's just there. He's just mm-hmm. he's just there. Um, but he was instrumental, and Grant really leaned upon him at the beginning yeah. of the Well, campaign. I think, and wasn't he the highest ranking officer killed in the Civil War? Well, we talk we talk about that with McPherson or Reynolds. It gets debated. Or, it all you could you could ask ten different people get ten different answers. It all goes back to when they got their star. Yeah, uh, but. Um, you know, people, people will tell you McPherson, people will tell you Reynolds, people are going to tell you Sedgwick. So yeah. I, I will say, though, at, at the, out of all those, those three specifically, Sedgwick's death had the most impact at the time. Mm-hmm. Because you're getting ready to go into this vicious battle, this set of battles you know is going to, to draw Lee out. And that's the whole point of the Overland campaign. Yeah. It's not to get Richmond, it's to dry Lee out and beat Lee. And now you lost, in your mind, your best general. Yeah. And you're, re- you're replacing with the guy who's green you know uh and that's that's the um that's what happens yeah and, and for you know fortunately fortunately for for grant well lee had just lost longstreet and we yeah. can go back with lee and longstreet and how they get along with that bullshit and all that stuff yeah but at the end of the day you're you're you, you lose longstreet that's a that's yeah. a big loss that's that is yeah loss. that's a huge loss yeah and caleb says cedric was a huge favorite among the men so he agrees with you he's, been, he's very overlooking that, he, he he just, say he that just, on the north he's the highest ranking killed he, he, he just gets he just gets overlooked for whatever reason and i think i think it's because he's kind of pedestrian at gettysburg i think yeah. people people look at hancock they look at reynolds they even look at howard the guys who, who fought yeah. um you know certainly people like that uh even sickles but they see Sedgwick as a guy who kind of stayed in the periphery a little bit. I mean, the six didn't do a hell of a lot, admittedly. Yeah. Um, but uh, he was somebody who was instrumental in um, the overall thing. I mean, he was yeah. someone who he had guys like Albie and Howe fighting with him. He had a lot of good people with him. But um, they they called him what the hell did they call him Uncle something John like, or something. Uncle John. I think it was Uncle John. They called him. Yeah. But he was a he was a big favorite of, of them. But Grant described his loss, like I said earlier, similarly like Lee described the loss of Stonewall, mm-hmm. especially at that moment. I mean, yeah. it's the you're about to fight the Super Bowl of games, right? And right before the opening coin toss, one of your best players goes down. Yeah. And now you're gonna bring somebody up and hope to God it works out. And it really didn't work out because they ended up kind of fighting to a stalemate. Um but that's a big Cedric. So we we I mean, his fun with Sedgwick and all that yeah, stuff. But that's, man. but but that's that was a big loss for them. Oh, yeah. He's a he's he a very 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 underrated guy. 
as far yeah. as far as that goes. But well, it's a lot you know, like the loss of McPherson for Sherman. Sherman that devastated him. Yeah, but in, instant karma got old Uncle John though. You know. Yeah. Oh, I know. They said they they said he he was dead on his horse and his horse was spinning around. And he couldn't fall off, and finally he fell off, and his men were devastated. God. You know? Well, I think there was a lot of sadness in the out in the Western theater over, um, you know, losing McPherson too. Like that was a huge loss. Like that was a guy that probably would have been president. And that's what Sherman said. Like Sherman said, he was going to be the one to like lead these armies. Eventually he was clearly very well respected. And I think that's why Howard had a tough time. Like when he was asked to be, lead that army is he's having, he's got huge shoes to fill, you know? No, there's, there's a lot of stuff with that. I mean, and people remember what they remember the most, the, the greatest moments, the worst moments. They don't, they don't look at anything else, but that that's, that's, that's the reality of it. Uh, but that, there was a lot of big losses, obviously, in both armies. I mean, think about a war where, I mean, imagine a war nowadays where you're losing all your top generals. It never happens. Yeah. Nowadays, a general sit in Florida and hit a button and watch the yeah. TV. You know, uh, you know, Longstreet shot by his own troops at the wilderness. Obviously, Jackson shot by 18 North Carolina at Chancellorsville. Reynolds gets gets shot in the, shot in the head. Sedgwick right. gets shot in the head. Um, and this just goes on and on and on. And this isn't talking about, you're, you're talking about the second level guys, guys like Dorsey yeah. Pender getting, you know, morally wounded. Uh, Pettigrew, people yeah. like that. Uh, it goes on and on with, with how many people in this military could have been bigger things. Yeah, well, then um, you have Franklin where there's, what, six of them taken out? Oh, exactly. And then for the Confederate side, you can look at the Franklin yep. six, all of them. Um, but that's that's that, that's war for you. Unfortunately, yeah. that's the way it is. But um, but it's important to look at look at the big picture with a lot of these things. It yeah. really is. Yeah, yeah. Caleb says a lot of people forget Reynolds' record in the Peninsula Campaign all because he was killed at Gettysburg. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, Peninsula wasn't a good time. You know, it, it was kind of like Stonewall in the Seven Days. People kind of brushed by it. But I mean, you yeah. look at you look at what he did. I mean, you know, Reynolds at Gettysburg was you know he was he wasn't there long. No, and and he he need. Whatever plans he made with with Howard over at Ritz Tavern, and um, it lost to history because yep. we doubled it. We doubled it. Howard charge. like Howard never spoke of what Howard never really said what they said that night at that meeting. Like he no, it's kind of like we met, we ate dinner. I went, I left. You know, well, especially since that wasn't the plan. No, the plan was to draw them out and fall back, and yeah. and then Double Day is like I thought I heard him say we're going to defend the city street to street, and even the movie Gettysburg he talks about that. Mm-hmm. Not double day, but they paraphrase and put the words right in Reynolds' mouth when he's talking to Sam Elliott yeah. there at the, at the cupola. Um, but there's a lot of questions. You like, wonder why why Buford was out there to start with, yeah. why Reynolds fought the way he did. Why didn't he engage and fall back uh, to the ridge line and where the 11th was waiting and then fall back to you know Pipe Creek? And, but those are the questions that they will never know because yeah. these guys got killed. Yeah, well, I think there was some like there was something said that night at that meeting. I would love to have been a fly in the wall that at, at that meeting because Howard just basically like he's very vague. Well, the know? Gettysburg Chamber of Commerce appreciated Reynolds because if God knows that town would be right now if it wasn't for, if it wasn't oh, I know. for the Battle of Gettysburg. Yeah, uh, but that's um, but that's what happens. That's what happens with, with yeah. these things is, is you'll never know. And unfortunately, with a lot of the documents being destroyed or lost, I mean, I always hold out hope that's that these things kind of recirculate and show up in someone's trunk or their I attic know. that tells these stories. Cause there's so many gray areas, uh, not just with Gettysburg, but all these battles that, um, that would, would fill in a lot of gaps. No question. Yeah, Jim says Sedgwick is a distant relative of Kyra, Kyra Sedgwick, who is married to Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. Yeah. Of- <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool with that. I mean, these people they didn't live that long ago. No, I mean, um, we meant, we mentioned, um, Mallet from North Carolina last week. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the great 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 grandfather of Will Ferrell, the actor. Yeah, that's crazy. And, and so there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of the history that goes with this. And it's pretty yeah. cool to you know to talk about this stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah Caleb said with Sickles in on the conspiracy. Does Howard mention him? Actually, Howard talks a little bit about Sickles. He's a lot of re- I think he had a lot of respect for him. Yeah. yeah. Well, he was. You, you can you can imagine just the, him and Butterfield and Hooker. You can only imagine how they, they were. They oh, were kind of like the. They were kind of like the, the the cool athletes in the high school. Yeah, the XXX core, right? You call it. And and then, and then you got guys like Howard and guys like Meade, um, who were kind of the the quiet, didn't so say much. And you got the Hancocks with the boy, the boisterous guys. You really get yeah. all of them. But but you can you can see, the, you can see the the hate. I mean, hate's probably too strong of a word, but you can see yeah. the 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 aggravation 
that a mead would have with the sickles. Yeah, yeah. Because, go, but, because going into it, they didn't get along. They talked about how the road, the, the wagon clogged up the roads. He was pissed off at that. Yeah. Um, and then there's all the, the, I'll just say it, there's all the tired BS about, about Sickles moving his line without orders, yeah. all that crap, but just, you know, like, leave that alone. Yeah. But, but there's a lot of post-war um, history that goes back and forth with yeah. uh, perception with a lot of the stuff. It's yeah. Sickles, Sickles could think- sit with it, you know? And I think a lot of this too is, um, and actually one of our episodes we're going to do um, around the time of Gettysburg is we are going to do an episode about Howard after Gettysburg and talk about his life from, from probably July 4th to the end of the Civil War. Right, um, so when he rises to the hand, the right hand of God yeah, yeah. and dies for our sins. God. His <laughs> death is like... He's the Christian general. He's the greatest thing since canned beer. He, 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 he. Oh, anyway, I did. I think I mentioned this on here, but I found out that Howard's final trip before he died was to Canada to give a That's talk in Ontario, That's true. which That's is in true. my which is about an hour from my hometown. So I do want to go to London sometime when you are back in Canada and see if we can find the building where he gave his last one of his last pub, which is where his last public appearances was. But he came back and he died like um, a week later. Uh, James is asking this: What took so long to do a Howard episode? Um, it, it's I think people are kind of expected it, but I was just like you know we've done some episodes can, can the title be run I'm gonna have a lot of um, fun making, we, a, making, the, I'm having making a meme for that episode yeah, the, the one thing that we have noticed is that you know that the talk about Howard it you know everybody bashes him for Chancellor's Bill they bash him not unfairly for Gettysburg and then after that like you know, people would say like, oh, I didn't know he was in the Western theater. Like, what did he do after that? Um, and it, it's, I don't know, he led to quite, he had quite a fascinating career. Um, the Western theater is where he shines. Now he has bad moments out there. No, too, he like, did. Like, I mean, like, we, like we, we've got a hundred plus episodes of Dwayne and Howard. So obviously yeah. we'll do one. Um, well, it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting. But no, he's, he's one of those guys who, who gets the shit into the stick historically in a lot of different cases. And, well, and a lot like of it, the, who did, what, what did he say? What Simpsons character did you say? Ned Flanders. Of the Ned Flanders. Game. That's that's kind of who. But I mean, they called him old prayer book and Hooker yeah. hated him. Said that he, you know, he was should have worn a petticoat instead of a blue coat. And, oh, and, and his, he was always telling his soldiers, you know, don't worry. After you die, you'll go to heaven. They go, well, that's all cool. But can you save my ass today? I'd like to live. I know. Yeah. You know? And that's like, they don't need the prayer. And obviously you're saying that to a bunch of free thinking Germans. They're not going Germans. They were not into the religion like Howard was. MJ said that she and I are going to throw down an East cemetery on, on cemetery Hill on July 1st, 160 years to the day. Girl, I, I, we're, we're planning. We, we might try and do a live stream when we're, we're down there um, that, you know, talk about the myth of Howard and Hancock fighting on cemetery hill because that didn't happen i mean no howard, i mean howard is a little butt hurt i think at first but then finally he's like all right i don't need to see your orders i believe you you know this is how it's going to be no but there's a, there's all there's also the perception too and we'll talk about this but whenever we decide to get around to doing this one but that you know if it wasn't you know hancock getting there save that save the gettysburg and that's not really true either the truth is always somewhere in between but it doesn't diminish one or the other they they I mean, in the heat of battle and shit's flying, everything's going back and forth. Yeah. They don't know what's going on. They don't know if Yule's going to be attacking that hill. You know, they don't. They don't know. Um, they all, you know, Howard set up the the line on on cemetery, yeah. on cemetery, the cemetery. He put Buford on the flank. He made sure Orland Smith stayed on with Steinwehr. He sent Coster out to fight an offensive. So it wasn't like he sat around and did nothing at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, did he get lucky that? That uh, Yule didn't attack. Well, maybe, but Yule might have fed right into right into his hands too. Mm-hmm. And again, it goes back to the, the sixth core and the twelfth core, where yeah. there's rumors that they're out there, and you have a whole extra Billy Smith with a fence pole story. And there's a million reasons why he didn't attack. But at the end of the day, Howard did the best he could when he found out that he was at the, on the Fauna Stock House that he was yeah. in charge. He got everyone back into a defensive position. He knew that was the he was that was the ground to fight, yeah. and and he held it. And the, the entire battle, day one, day two, and day three, was all about the Confederacy trying to take Cemetery Hill. Yeah. And because of that Gibraltar, he helped set up. They were able to defend it. Yeah. Um, and that that was the Battle of Gettysburg in a nutshell. So it's tough to blame Howard. 
Um, yeah, I think it's just it goes back to the, the and we were watching the movie last night. And it goes back to the the whole like, you know, like the one scene that happens when Mead shows up and he goes to the house um, and he talks to Hancock. What Hancock says to him was what Howard had said to Mead because Hancock wasn't on the field when Mead arrived. Slocum was on the field by that point and in charge because he was the highest ranking officer. Um, So when Slocum arrived, that meant that Howard relinquished the control to him. But Mead arrived and Howard and Slocum and then Sickles met him at the the cemetery gatehouse. Um, So that cemetery gatehouse is where Mead met them. And that was about one, two in the morning. It's debated um, as to what time it was. Um, But, you know, Mead gets there and it's like, is this good ground? And Howard's like, yes. And Slocum and Sickles agreed with him that yep. it was good ground. Mm-hmm. And yes, yeah, so there's something similar to the whole like, well, I don't have a choice. We have to fight it out here. But yeah, like not to downplay Hancock's role at all, but that scene in the movie did not take place the way it No, but then, no, but it's not a movie. It is what it is. Exactly. But I mean, um, well, but, oh, and then Frank asked, speaking of Gettysburg, uh, for the 160th, what are some of the must see events happening? Uh, MJ said the Daniel Lady Farm Reenactment programs right. at Heritage Center. Um, there's Ranger Walks as well. There's a lot going on. There's a there's bunch happening with the Adams County Historical Society. Adams County is well. doing a, Gary Edelman and Tim Smith. Uh, Stephen Lang's going to be there yep. for the Adams County. There. He'll he'll be there. So, um, well, not Pickett, but Stephen Lang. Yeah. Pickett will be there. I, that'd be I go see that. But it's actually That's Pickett. Awesome. But the Daniel Lady Farm on all three days will do reenactments. There's a lot of cool stuff. This podcast. We'll be doing some stuff too. We're trying to arrange some stuff too with some different things that hopefully yeah. we can announce. So, uh, but there's a lot of stuff going on. MJ has got her her um, her yeah. living history that she's got going over there at Heritage Park. So there's a lot yeah. of things going on in town. So, um, so definitely definitely watch this spot if you're going to Gettysburg. So we're gonna do we're definitely gonna do a handful of get togethers. We're definitely yeah, we're gonna, gonna do a, a beer a beer thing at some probably four yeah. score again probably. Yeah, four score something. was the easiest place, but yeah, we're trying to um, organize with one group right now to do something, obviously history related, um, as well. And we're just working out the details for for that, but we want to do something too. So, but yeah, we are going to be in town for that, and we're definitely going to do like a gathering, which we'll announce on Facebook probably soon. We should decide that what we're going to do. Yeah, and I think we'll be doing a handful of Facebook lives at different points. Yeah. There's some there's some things that uh, we want to try to do. Uh, so it'll be a lot of fun. And then again, it's not to diminish Vicksburg, everyone, no. not, but, but that's where we're going to be. So um, we'll be down, we'll be down there. And it was the biggest battle in the Western hemisphere, you know, Gettysburg. So we have to, you know, I just finished. And I have to say like um, the one thing I enjoy about the program I'm doing is uh, like, I'm, I'm doing my master's degree right now. For those that don't know from library sciences, I got to do two projects this semester that were, were civil war related. And one of them was a Gettysburg project. And the other was a library guide for the battle of Chickamauga. And I really enjoyed that. I found a whole bunch of books about Chickamauga. I also realized that Dave Powell is like the authority on Chickamauga. <laughs> He's written so many books. Um, but I found out there was a new book that came out about John T. Wilder um, mm-hmm. and his, which talks about his time as mayor of Chattanooga. Um, and then like, I included a lot of books in the guide. I included one about, um, the Cal- Calvary at during the Chickamauga campaign and how mm-hmm. much they fuck things up for they should be more to blame for what happened because there was so much miscommunication and it was all falling on Forrest and Wheeler yeah. um, that were feeding Bragg this information back to him. Um, but it was a really um, interesting guide to put together because I got to find a lot of new sources as well. Yeah, that, that's this is, a, this is there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good. Um, there's a lot of good. Th- authors and writers in different battles if you, if you, when you when you want to go out of the out of the berg if you want to get out you know do that whole thing um but that's that'll be fun this we're coming into the 160th for you know for a couple yeah. you know we obviously and then next year is is this 160th of, of, of overlands all this so we're coming into that the 160th of these next couple of years 160th mathematics is two years away so this is this is, this is the time um, so hopefully people, if you can't get out east, go to, you know, go to Vicksburg, go to some of those, those 1863 battles mm-hmm. in the West that are really important to do. Uh, but Gettysburg will be a big one. This will be a big deal. I don't know if it'll be as big as the 150th, but it'll, it'll still be pretty big. I think yeah. there are more, Gettysburg Foundation has a lot more little things to do now. They've got that, uh, that the 
uh, the pass tour. They've got the children's tour. Yeah. And of course, the, the new museum over there. There's mm-hmm. a lot of stuff to do. So hopefully people go. I, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of people in town. I think so. So we, we, might, be, we might be doing a lot of um, sitting around the fire pit, drinking at night instead of going to the bars this time, I think. But that's, that's okay. Um, that. Frank was wondering if the uh, first ever Buster tour is confirmed. You'll have to talk to John Gentilly about that. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's he's, he's doing do his Colonel Darlin tour. His Colonel Darlin bus tour. Oh, I, I've always said that, that there needs to be a Colonel Darlin's Irish bar in Gettysburg or Buster's. That, that'd be so yep. funny if they did that. But I'm sure there'd be some yep. kind of. See you later, MJ. Thanks for coming on here. MJ, we'll talk to you soon. Have a have a good one. Keep keep those Yankees losing. We love it. God. She's rolling her eyes at you right now. <laughs> I'm sure she is. That's okay. But yeah, but, no, um, it'll, it'll be it'll be good. Um, I'm looking forward to September too. I know we're not going to be there, but the anniversary of Chickamauga because they usually do some pretty good programming there. Jim Ogden is like the amazing ranger that works there, and I found um, she found a really cool video. I didn't put it in my library guide, um, but it was of a guy that portrays John T. Wilder. Yeah, it was from the 150th, and they were at the Wilder Monument. And I'd never seen a Spencer demonstrated before, but that was so cool. It's pretty like, cool, isn't it? How, yeah. how they load them. And then like it, it, they basically showed the formation, what Wilder's guys did, which they would, you know, they loaded them and then they would just kind of get down on, on one knee and they would just fire off the seven rounds at the Confederates. Mm-hmm. And then they would um, get back on their horses and they would ride a few hundred yards yeah. away, you know, and then the Confederates had to like get all in formation again. And you really like seeing that, gave me even more of an appreciation for what Wilder did um, because he was out, he and Minty were outnumbered, but you know, if you're at Chickamauga drive down um, Alexander bridge road and go right down to Alexander bridge. Um, yeah. It's not the, it's not the, the real bridge because Wilder burnt that. Um, but you can go across Chickamauga Creek on the bridge and you can see the Creek and stuff and you can see where they were fighting and it's really cool. It's so worth doing. Have you ever seen actual canister fired? Yeah, that that's amazing to see. And how how do these poor bashers are coming up against these, these smooth boards, canisters? It's unbelievable. But we'll have a you know I, I was going to say something I totally forgot, but um, the first time you know, early on set probably. Yes. But um, but no, and this there's, there's a lot of cool stuff coming. I'm looking forward to the summer. I'm looking forward to a lot of the stuff we're going to be doing. I, I think Gettysburg 160 will be huge. I think Vicksburg mm-hmm. 160. I hope I hope they do a lot of stuff with it. But uh, it seems like there's a lot of stuff going on in Gettysburg this time. They're really going into it. Um, I'm sure it'll be it'll be a busy it'll be a busy time. There's no question. Yep. You know, oh, Ryan's on here. He's sorry, sorry, I can't join you today, Kingless Rebels. But we have an important, almost sacred event on today. In the words of George the Third, I hope you won't suffer for want of a king. Hey, I'm represent Ryan. Told you. Yeah. So am I. I got Washington on. You know, as silly as we may think a king here is. Okay, admittedly, um, but that it's a it's a big deal. So my British, I am British, you know, by this by heritage. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm with you. So hopefully, with Charles in charge over there, I'm hopefully uh, everything will be will be good. Hopefully, everything will be will work itself out just right. And mm-hmm. um, and I'm sure Lady Diana is loving the fact that it's pouring rain down there tonight. I'm sure she's <laughs> loving the fact that it is. It is. <laughs> anyway, but but uh, yeah, this we had a lot of cool stuff. So we'll, mm-hmm. spots of will be coming up next week, and then we'll do a pickets mill after that. Yeah. But I think I think it's it's cool to it's cool to um the top of all the things we did today. We probably get ready to jump off here in a second. It's almost it's coming around to yep. past eleven thirty. It's yep. a beautiful day. I know. Sitting, yeah, sitting outside fun. drinking beers is calling at this point. Yeah. You know? I think so. Yeah. So when we get when we get ready to jump off, so so yep. thanks for really jo- joining us today. So we'll, we'll have a uh, we got some stuff coming this week. So hopefully, uh, finally, finally, the spring weather is here and summer yep. is on the horizon. Nice out today. It's so nice out. But yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if you haven't yet listened to our episode about Pete Carmichael that dropped last Saturday, uh, we had a really great conversation with him. Oh, and that's another thing too. So Civil War Institute is coming up uh, June 9th to fourteenth, and if any of y'all are thinking of going. Um, you can, I think it's a 15% discount. You get a 15% discount from yes. the old Civil War Breakfast Club by using the code PAR. Yeah, yeah, PAR. Yeah. So if you sign up for PAR, you'll get 15% off and you can go and you can check out all that stuff um, and get a good discount. Pizza yep. guy. He's such a good guy. Pete's a friend of ours. He's a good dude. So um, if you come to one of our drinking events in Gettysburg, uh, pretty good chance that he, he may come out with join us you get to meet yeah. him so, so that's a, yeah he's a well, very nice guy um and yeah definitely check out his book to the war for the common soldier and don't we, we cannot forget mary our friend lisa sammy has yes, got about may 9th coming up yes so we so so uh we we sent that on social media she's doing a speaking event 
Uh, we'll send out the details to that. So if you haven't heard Lisa talk, we went, we were, we had the privilege mm-hmm. uh, of going down to, um, to Richmond uh, yeah. to, to, uh, to go see her speak. And her speech is, uh, is very, very good. She does a lot of good stuff. So uh, she she's book got her new out. book coming out soon too, which is going to be our book in our book club this year. It's going to be the last book we do for 2023. That is so good. Pretty cool. But definitely um, check that, check that out. We will send the details out um, for, for Lisa's thing. So we'll send that out again. If you are, uh, if you have a chance to go see her speak, I would highly suggest you. Yes, she's, she's a she's, wonderful she's, artist. She's very, she's very talented. good. Yeah. And if you, and if you see her, tell her that you, you, we sent her, that is the truth. And then yeah. Do this. yeah. She'll know what you mean. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, Char- Charles said great time as always. Thank you. Oh, Thank hey, you Charles. Good. How you doing? Thank you. Charles. All right. So let's get ready to jump off, Mary. So we're going to go off and I'm sure you want to watch some of the coronation stuff. And you probably oh, yeah. want to wax poetic about all of Queen Victoria yeah. and Queen Elizabeth. I got my friend, uh, George. Where is he? Right there. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I am repre- I am representing uh, the heritage today. And I even got my little Canadian flag. Aww. So that, I guess that counts too, because some yeah. people don't, don't want to revolt. So, all right, <laughs> off we go. Have a great, safe weekend, everybody. Hopefully uh, it is warm where you are. Stay safe, be good to each other, have a good time, and we look forward to talking to you all down the road on the other side. Peace out. See you guys next weekend. We'll-